OK, so what, what we have seen last time was how to associate to each regular curve. So now we are in this special class of curves, space curves, uh, three vectors, which somehow should uh, remember all the geometry of the curve itself, the tangent, the normal, and the binormal. Okay? These are orthonormal by definition. These, they form an orthonormal basis of R3 for each time. So for each time, we have a three vectors. And we have to imagine that they move around in space okay, as time goes on. Okay? So the way they move, they sh should remember the geometry of the underlying curve, which was giving birth to them. Okay? So now the question is, somehow, have we finished the study? I mean, we have introduced two functions and three vectors. Okay? Tangent, normal, and binormal, and two functions, curvature and torsion. Is there anything else we should discover about the geometry of curves? Well, the way to, to say no, actually, that's it. That's the end of the story, is to prove that if you give me two functions k, that I would like to call k and tau, there is a unique curve having k and k, tau as curvature and torsion. Okay? If I prove this, that means these two functions, it's all, it's all there is. Okay? There is nothing else to be discovered. Okay, so how and this is the topic of this lecture. Okay, so how do we prove it? Now, <laughs> so remember we start. We always start with a, a differentiable curve, and we always assume it's parameterized by arc length because if it's not, we can always do it. Okay, so this is not this is not an assumption. The only assumption really we make is this is a curve which has positive curvature everywhere at every time. So it's a regular curve. And now there is a little trick because we, ha we have learned how to associate to each time, and actually time since it's the, the arc length, I will call it s. Okay? So to each parameter, I know how to associate three vectors, this famous orthonormal basis, the Frenet uh, uh, three-hedron. Okay? But instead of look, so I have a three, three vectors in R3. So just as a, as a convention, I look at as a map from the same interval. So to each time s, I associate a vector, a column vector, OK? t of s, n of s, b of s. So I put the components of the three vectors in column. So I get 3 plus 3 plus 3. So this is a, a point in R9, OK, 3, 3, 3. And a, a, a nice way to, to write down the Frenet formula in this matrix form is to say that the Frenet formula is say like t prime, n prime, b prime as a vector, OK, is equal to what? Is equal to kn minus kt minus tau b and tau n. OK, so this is component by component. I just put the three equations in, in vector form. But I want to write it as a matrix, in matrix representation in this form. So let me write it, and then I comment the notation. So this big matrix, 9 by 9, times the column vector t and b. So what does it mean, this notation? This notation means what I call 0, 3, or O3 if you want, it doesn't matter. This is the 3 by 3 matrix made all, whose all components are 0. Okay? So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0. So this is a block representation. Okay? So if I want to write a 9 by 9 matrix, I can tell you 3 by 3, 3 by 3, 3 by 3, and so on. Okay? And what is ID3? Well, this is just the identity matrix of rank 3. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. Okay? Now, in this for this is just a notation. Okay? There is nothing new. You see, if I do 
the, the row by column multiplication, you see that here I get 0 times t, so 0, plus kn plus 0, so I get kn, which is exactly what appears here, and so on. So it's just a convenient way. Nothing, we are not learning anything. But it's, it, it, will be, it will become very useful, okay? So now let me state the, what is called the fundamental theorem. of the local theory of curves, okay, long name. So this is the theorem which answers the, 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 the problem I was mentioning a few minutes ago. So give me two functions. So given two functions, k naught and tau naught, from some interval to R, these are real value functions. I only require that these are smooth, because in general they will have to be smooth. Okay? And the only requirement is that K, what at the end should be the curvature, has to be a positive function. Okay? Okay? So given such two functions, there exists a curve alpha from the same interval into space, R3, parameterized with arc length, and such that k of s is equal k naught of s. So its curvature is equal to the first given function, and its torsion and tau of s is equal to tau naught of s, OK? So this answers the first part of the problem. So give me any two functions such that the first one is positive. There is a curve such that the, these two functions are curvature and torsion. But I want to know more. How many curves are there with this property? Moreover. So that's the, the, the second answer that this theorem is giving us. Alpha is unique. And as we commented last time, unique, what is the best uniqueness theorem you can hope? Up to rigid motions of R3. Okay. Up to, up to direct isometries. Remember, we just commented quickly of R3. Isometries are of two types. Basically, they are translations plus an orthogonal transformation. The orthogonal transformation could have determinant 1 or minus 1. If it's positive, so plus 1, we call it direct. Okay? So, well, that's the best you can hope. Okay? This is telling us that the problem is solvable, and it's pro solvable in the unique way which is meaningful. OK, okay let's prove it. Unfortunately, the blackboard is quite small, so this notation is useful. But OK, let me start here, and then we have to erase. Proof. Let's look at the following ordinary differential equation. Look at the following. So x prime of s is equal a naught of s x of s. Okay. Let me call this equation star, where a naught of s is formally the matrix that I constructed here. You see, this 9 by 9 matrix, but where I use of course, my, my starting data are these two functions, k0 and tau0. I still don't have a k and tau. OK, so formally, I just define it to be 0, 3, k0 of s. OK, I, I write of s only here, then I drop it, because these are functions, OK? Identity, 3, 
O3 minus K not identity O3 minus tau not O3 O3 tau not identity O3. Okay? So I use these two functions to construct this matrix. And now what do I do? So, of course, x will be a 9, a vector in R9, okay? Because this is a, an equation in R9. Okay, choose. Now we, we have to make some choice. And then we, at the end, we will comment the effect of this choice on the final output. But choose some fixed vector A in R9. You see, if we want to solve an ordinary differential equation, this is a first order equation. So somehow we have to give an initial data. Okay? And this will be, this will be the, 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 the thing. And uh, sorry, choose a, uh, a vector in R9. But of course, we are interested so such that we have to split it in the first three components, the second three components, and the third three components. These are the geometrically interesting bits. So such that if I call T0, T0 uh, as a vector, the first three components, A1, A2, A3, and not A4, A5, A6, and B0 to be equal A7, A8, A9, okay? Sorry, of course. You're right. Okay. So the requirement I make on the initial data, A, is that if I take the first, the, I split into three vectors, T and B, formally, they are still not a, a frenetri hedron of anything, but T and B, uh, I would like them to form an orthonorm, a positively oriented, so such that these three vectors form an oriented orthonormal basis. of R3, okay? That's a very natural thing to ask because at the end I would like this, this to be true at every time. So this is kind, I want to start from a configuration which looks like an orthonormal basis. Then I want to evolve following this differential equation and I want to prove that it stays an orthonormal basis, okay? So now, Formally, how do, you do, how do we do? Set f to be a function from i to r9, solution of star. Okay. Solution exists because this is a linear ordinary differential equation. Okay. But then if we take a solution in R9, again, we split it in the first three components, second three components, and third three components. Okay, so, and define T, sorry, T, which now is a function, a vector valued function, okay, to be F1, F2, F3, N will be F4, F5, F6, and B will be F7, F8, F9. Okay, and now these are functions of S. Sorry, of course I didn't write it, but it's, it goes without saying. So set F to be a solution of star with initial data A. Okay the unique solution with initial data A, okay? So what do we want to prove? We want to prove first that actually these three vectors will form a positively oriented orthonormal basis for any S, okay? We know it for S equal to zero, no? We know it at the beginning. 
and we want to know that this property is preserved. <coughs> so we want to prove that if I put now t and b as three distinct vectors, this is, is an orthonormal positive, okay, positive orthonormal basis of R3 for any S, okay? So this is the point. How do we do it? Well, simple trick. Look at at this matrix here. M of S, well, how do I know if something forms an orthonormal basis? I can consider the matrix of all possible scalar products. And that's exactly what I'm going to do now. So I take the matrix, the 3 by 3 matrix, given by TT, sorry, TN, TB, and so on. Tn, it will be symmetric, of course, Nn, Nb, and then Tb, Nb, Bb. So let's look at this matrix here. See, of course, another way to say our claim, to state our claim, is that this matrix is constantly equal to the identity. Okay. So the point is that this matrix automatically satisfies a nice differential equation because x was satisfying star. It's a simple computation to prove the following. That if I take the twice the derivative of m, I get exactly this, A of S, M of S, minus M of S, A of S, where now this is a 3 by 3 matrix, OK? This is a 3 by 3, 3 by 3, and A will be a 3 by 3 matrix. A of S is the matrix constructed formally. You see, now I pick again this form here, but instead of imagining this of be three by three blocks, I just put them a number. So zero, one, zero, and so on. So this is just the matrix zero, k naught, zero, minus k naught, zero, minus tau naught, zero, k naught, uh, tau naught, zero. Of course, of s, okay? These are functions. <coughs> OK, now this is very simple. I'm not cheating you, OK? In, 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 in three lines, you prove that star implies this equation here. And the fact that we started from an initial data with the property that if I split it, I get an orthonormal basis, I also know that m of 0, you see, at time 0, I know that this matrix is the identity because of the property of T naught and not B naught. Okay. But now again, this, this equation here has a unique solution given a, 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 an initial datum. So the only thing I need to observe is that m of s constantly equal to the identity. Is actually a solution. Put m equal to the identity. Of course, the derivative of the identity is 0, because it's all made of constants. 
So you get 0 is equal a minus a, 0. So it's a solution. But the system has a unique solution, given the, given the initial datum. And this satisfies the initial datum, of course. So this must be the solution. Okay, But that's exactly the claim. That's exactly the claim. This matrix here is constantly the identity. But that means that this is constantly equal to 1. This is constantly equal to 0. This is constantly equal to 0, and so on. So, so exactly the claim. This is a orthonormal basis. There is actually a little comment to be made here. It was a positive basis at time 0. It stays orthonormal for every time. Now, that's what we proved. Why should be a positive orthonormal for every time? Please speak much louder. Because of properties of the determinant. What does it mean positive? It means that if I write the matrix transformation, which takes one basis to the other for two different times, no? Positive means it has determinant 1. OK? But now, how is it possible? Suppose that for some s, this has become negative. I mean, there are only two possibilities, positive or negative, because it's a basis. It's an orthonormal basis. OK? But by continuity of the determinant, it means in between, there has to be a time where it was 0. The transformation between the two bases had to have determinant 0. But this is impossible because it has to be an isomorphism for every time. OK? So if it starts positive, it stays positive for all time. OK? So also this property is easily checked. OK. Well, up to now, you see, up to now, what, what have we done? Given two functions, k0 and tau0, we have constructed the only, and now we will comment why it's the only, Frenet basis, T and B, which a curve, a possible curve, could have if it had curvature K0 and torsion tau0. So now the, the problem is, where is the curve? So now we have T and B. How do I construct alpha? Well, but that's not the problem. Now, define alpha, alpha from the same interval to R3, to be what? Alpha of s, if I know the tangent vector, it's enough to know t. Okay? Because if I know t, alpha of s will be just the integral between s0 and s of t of u in the u. What is t? t is the first derivative vector. Okay? So if I integrate, I get alpha. There is only one alpha who could have t as a tangent vector, OK? OK? So the first part of the theorem is proved. Because why? Because now we got alpha. What is the triedron associated to alpha? Well, by construction, is exactly t so what is the tangent vector to this alpha is precisely this t by construction. What is the normal vector to this alpha? Well, it's the derivative of t times k, OK? But this is exactly the derivative of t has been constructed in a way that it is exactly n. And what is the binormal of alpha? Well, again, I take the derivative of the normal and so on. So it's all constructed in the way that the Frenet triedron of this is exactly t and b. And the curvature and the torsion of alpha are exactly k0 and tau0. There is nothing to be proved. So one comment about uniqueness. Because we said this curve, now, now we have a curve with the desired properties. But why it is unique? In which sense it is unique? Well, I had one degree of freedom here because nobody has told me where to start to integrate, passing from the tangent vector to the curve itself. What is the effect of changing this base point? Well, it's just a translation in R3. Okay? It means I'm just starting the curve from another point. 
translation. And then what else? Well, my, my young, you see, every time you, say, you see the word choose, that means you had the freedom. So let's go back to see. If I had picked another vector, A, of course, the properties I wanted, so another vector, if you want A prime, whose three com first three components, second three components, third three components formed a, a positive orthonormal basis. And then repeat the argument. Of course, F would be different because it's a different initial data. But then M would be, well, no, M, uh, M is always uh, the identity. So F will be different, and the three vectors T and B will be different because are the three components, again, splitting of this function. Okay. But how do it change? Well, if A and A prime, they have this property, they are related by a, an orthogonal transformation of R3. And then pick this orthogonal transformation, positive, with determinant 1. Pick this orthogonal transformation of R3, and that means that T, if you want, you have T and B and T prime and prime B prime. Okay? Everything is related by this transformation. But then the final output is related by the same transformation. Because T and T prime are related by an orthogonal transformation. So also alpha and alpha prime would be related by an orthogonal transformation. OK? So, so there is really nothing to write except identifying the places where you are making choices. And see that the, up, the output is translation plus orthogonal transformation of R3 of positive determinant. OK, so that ends, this ends the proof of the theorem. <coughs> well, as, of course, the, the name of the theorem says, that's really the end of the story for curves in R3. It means we have discovered everything that was to be discovered. So a curve is completely determined by curvature and torsion. And so that's it. So besides making some nice exercises, there is, this is really the end of the first part of the course. This kind of differential geometry in dimension one, it's over. But I would like to use this last part of this lecture to tell you about a classical problem in the theory of curves, which somehow has inspired so much research that I think you should be aware of it. So the problem I would like to describe you, and the solution, is, is about planar curve. Simple, closed planar curves. What does that mean? Well. Clearly, it means we have a function. Our curve now goes in R2, OK, automatically, because it's planar. What does it mean it's closed? Well, suppose we give names to this interval. So suppose that this interval is given by some a, b. I'm slightly stretching our definition, because usually the, the interval is open, OK? But doesn't really matter. Now, suppose it's defined on a closed set, and differentiable means the obvious extension to the differentiability. So it means you have a derivative, a limit of the derivative going to the left extreme coming from the right, and the limit of the derivative coming to the right extreme from the left. And they two, and these two, so closed means that alpha of A is equal to alpha of B. Okay, so it's, a, it's really a loop. Simple means no self-intersection. If you want, alpha is injective. Okay. And when I say, I repeat, when I say differentiability, I also mean that the tangent vector coincides also when you take the limit on the two extremes. So really, we are talking about the simplest thing. Okay. So it doesn't really matter where I put alpha of A is equal to alpha of B. 
Okay? So you start from here, you go around, you go back here at the other extreme, and the two tangent vectors, so the tangent vector coming from this way and this way must coincide. Okay? It has to be smooth also in this direction. So there is a beautiful problem coming at least from the third century before Christ. So this is the first time at least we have a written record. And actually, you have to apologize your lecturer now because I'm full of uh, Western civilization. And of course, we tend to think that Greeks invented everything and uh, all our mathematical culture come from Greece, from ancient Greece. It's very likely that in India or in China or in somewhere in Africa, similar problems were studied a couple of thousands years before. So, but at least that's the way we, we came to know it. Okay. What the problem I would like to describe you is called the isoperimetric problem. So for what we know, it appeared in a treaty, in a mathematical treaty about that time. So what does this problem say? Well, question. Among, among all planar, simple, closed, curves of given length of length L, okay? Suppose you give me a positive number. So among all planar curves of that length, which one bounds the region of largest area okay may I ask you how many of you have seen this problem please raise your hand one one okay good enough to repeat it okay <laughs> you will be a bit bored OK, you understand the problem. So for example, suppose this curve has length, uh, I don't know, one meter, more or less. So here's another one with probably the same length, and so on. So actually, this question is hiding a very delicate problem. So a simple closed curve in R2 separates the plane in two parts. What we, one which is bounded and another one which is unbounded. Okay? This is very intuitive, but it's actually not easy to prove. Okay? It's called the Jordan separation theorem. It was one of the early success of modern topology. Okay? But of course, everybody assumed it was true. You see, things can get very, very complicated, okay? because this is a simple closed curve, and so on. Okay? Now, if I tell you which is the interior of this curve, I mean, is this point interior or exterior? OK? So of course, it's a matter of enlarging. I mean, of course, there are techniques, topological techniques, which are actually quite easy. A little bit what is called degree theory gives you a simple answer to this problem. But nevertheless, it's true. Okay. So let's assume I'm, I'm not going to make any topological uh, consideration up to now. So this question is about, the, of course, the area of the bounded. So every curve splits the plane in two parts. And you, of course, you can measure the area only of the bounded part, okay? because the other one will have infinite area, whatever the curve is. Actually, the first Greek contribution, so the place where this problem was born, 
the only contribution it was made to this question was to prove that if you give me a number, a positive number, the area enclosed by the regular polygon of that perimeter grows as the number of edges grows. You see what I mean? So what the, 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 the theorem that was proved here, for example, if you take an equilateral triangle of a given perimeter, the area inside is less than the square of the area inside the square of the same perimeter. And the area of the square is less of the area of the pentagon and the hexagon eh? and so on. Actually, this is suggesting the solution. But the solution escaped the author of the problem. Okay? The solution, not much mystery, is this one. Okay? So if you give me a length, of course, you can construct the circle of that perimeter. And the area inside the circle is maximal among all simple closed curves with that length as perimeter. Okay. Actually, this has been popularized at the beginning of, uh, I mean, around. Uh, in mathematical language, it was really formulated precisely about, I think, 200 after, after Christ by a mathematician called Pappus in a, in a very intriguing treaty about the life of bees. So why somebody studying bees should come up with this problem? Well, that's a curiosity, of course. If you look at the play, I mean, the, what is called the hive, I mean, the, uh, then of course you would like to give us an explanation why bees live in uh, se hexagon cellulars and the inside they form circular tunnels. Okay? And somehow this is related exactly to this question. Okay? They want to maximize the space where to live. You see, of course, building their home costs energy because it costs wax. Okay? So you want to make the biggest space out of the least possible wax. Okay? So in some sense, bees know the answer to this solution. Okay. And the other historical comment before putting our hands in the proof is that this was actually became a very famous problem in mathematics because it's part of a famous history by Virgilius. So this is about 50 after Christ, where he's telling us the story of the queen Dido. In fact, it's always, it's often referred to Dido's problem. So Dido was a Phoenician queen, which was for some reason had to leave Middle East, and with all, with, a, with, with some people, escaped to Carthago, which is in modern Tunisia. Okay? When they get to Carthago, they ask the king of Carthago to give them some land where to build a new town. Of course, the local people didn't want to give land. Okay? But there was, they were obliged in ancient times, of course, hospitality was supposed to be a, a holy okay, thing. So instead of saying no, the king said, OK, you can take all the land that you can put inside what, uh, the skin of a cow. Of course, this looks like, seems like a trick. OK, because you, you kill a cow, you take the skin, and it's probably more or less like this. OK, so what kind of town can you build? But of course, Dido knew mathematics. So what has she done? She has taken a cow, she killed, she takes the skin, she took the skin, and she made a little wire with the skin. Okay? And then with this wire, she embraced a huge piece of land. And to maximize the land, she actually put the wire into a circular configuration. So she knew mathematics, and she guessed the solution. And of course, she, she was able to build a pretty big town okay, by solving this problem and cheating the king 
who was actually trying to cheat her. So very, very noble story. Okay? That's why you will always ref see it referred in books as Dido's problem. Okay? But now, end of story. Let's go to mathematics. Actually, the first complete mathematical solution to this problem came by Weierstrass, was given by Weierstrass in 1870, around 1870. Well, there was probably another proof, but it's not clear whether it was really complete 30 years before. So Weierstrass wrote the complete proof. Okay? The one I'm going to uh, tell you is given by Schmidt about 1940. And since then, we, we now have many solutions, many proofs of this, of this fact. The reason I'm telling you, just for, first because I think it's good you know a little bit of history. Actually, if you like, I mean, this, this and other problems of this type are beautifully explained in a book that I strongly recommend you. It's called The Parsimonious Universe. By Anthony Tromba. By Tromba, and I think also Hildebrand, probably there are two authors, but I, know, I remember. This is a set of mathematical problems all coming from the same philosophical point. And it's that nature minimizes effort in doing whatever it wants to do. Okay? And this is one, one place where we can see it. Now, <coughs> so the proof I'm going to give you heavily relies in, uh, on Green's theorem. So let me remind you the, the version of Green's theorems, of Green's formula, actually, that I'm going to use. Okay. It's a classical theorem in calculus. It's a corollary of Stokes' theorem for, for what it counts. So suppose you take two functions of two real variables, f and g, at least of class C1 over R2. Okay. And suppose R is the interior region or the bounded region given a boundary, uh, sorry, it's a bounded region uh, inside the curve C in R2. Okay. Now, by a curve, I really mean the image, okay? not just a parameterized curve. So Green's formula tells me this. So then, if I take the integral over r of the function dg dx minus df minus df dy in dx dy, this is equal to the integral over the curve of f dx dt my plus g dy dt in dt. So this is a linear integral, so depends on one parameter t. Okay. Okay, so so this is a general theorem. Actually, the, the way I'm going to use it by taking f f is equal to minus y, and g is equal to x. If I substitute there, what do I get? Well, if f is equal to minus y, of course, here I get minus 1 with a minus. It's a plus. And dg dx is another plus. OK? So here I get 2, the integral of 2. But that's exactly twice the area of r, huh? twice the area of r, is equal exactly to, well, if c is our simple closed curve parameterized by alpha from a, b, okay? So this is the integral between 
A and B, and then F, uh, well, let me first write G, which comes with a plus. So G is X, so it's X of T dy dt, and then plus F, which is minus, so minus Y of T dx dt in dt. Okay, so this is actually the corollary of the Green's functions that, of the Green's theorem that I'm going to use. Okay? And so now I can state the theorem, which goes under the name of isoperimetric inequality, because actually, so under all the, assum all the notations that we are using, I'm not going to repeat it, L squared is greater than or equal 4 pi area of R, and moreover, moreover, equality, L squared equal to 4 pi area of R, if and only if, C is a circle, or if you want, alpha parameterizes a circle. Okay? So this is the complete solution to the, to the ancient problem, no? In mathematical language. <coughs> now, to give you the proof, I need to make a little picture. So, let me erase this. So, the picture I want to something like this. So suppose I have my simple closed curve. Okay. This is my C. And then I take, in some, I, take uh, I decide to, to bound it by two vertical lines. So the first one tangent will be this one. The second tangent will be something like this. And then, of course, my picture won't fit. But I mean, now here, so this gives me a possible, a candidate diameter for a circle. So below here, I try to draw somehow the corresponding circle with this diameter, OK? Well, more or less, OK? So here, there would be more or less the center of this, and this I call x, and this I call y, OK? So this is my curve alpha of s. Suppose I'm going in this direction. This is alpha of s, OK? And suppose I, I choose time in such a way that this is alpha of 0. After all, changing names of the point doesn't matter. And suppose that this is alpha of another point, and now I'm not free to choose another name. I cannot say this is 1. So Suppose this is alpha of S1. So these are the two points where there is a vertical tangent which is bounding the curve itself. Okay? So this is the region inside R, and this is our curve C. OK, so this is kind of a background, uh, background picture to understand what's going on. Now. So in my picture, these are called L and L prime. So referring to this picture, I call this the center, the center of this. Uh, it's clear how it's constructed, OK? 
So I take th these two vertical lines, which are the first one on both sides, which intersect the, the curve C. Okay? So this gives me some kind of a, an amplitude. And below my curve, I draw a circle with this di diameter. Okay? I'm not going to write in language the explanation. Okay? So if alpha, if C is parametrized by arc length as alpha of s, so this is a planar problem, so it, is, it has two x of s, y of s. Okay, it has two components. Again, I, and I choose the, the, the interval in such a way that this point corresponds to alpha of 0, and these points correspond to an unknown number, s1. Okay. So, we, but if such, under this condition, we can choose a parameterization of the circle. We can choose a parameterization of the circle below. In fact, let me call it C prime. Okay. of C prime as, again, beta of S. So it will be some kind of another curve, beta. But I can fix this first coordinate to be X of S. But now, of course, the second component will be another function that I call Y bar. Okay. Y bar is just another name for another function, okay? If you want to call it another name, it's okay. Now, remember that S was arc length. So actually the interval where the curve C is defined is zero, because I'm assuming I'm starting from zero there, to L. L is my given perimeter. Okay, in the isoperimetric problem. Okay. Arc length go measures exactly the length. So the final point will be parameterized at time L. Okay. Now, let, let's try to give an estimate about the area. Area, the area of R. Uh, just one second. Okay. Uh, remember the formula I just erased. Let's, let's comment one second on this formula. Remember, we have just observed. Actually, first I put the two here. Now let me put it. So this is one half. So the formula we wrote before was the integral between the two extremes. Now the extremes are 0 and L, OK? Of what? Of x, y prime minus x prime, y of t of s in d s, OK? So this was the formula we, we took from Green's theorem, OK? But now the point is that these two integrals are the same. Because the curve is closed, you see now the only little observation is this one. If you take the integral between 0 and L of x prime y, for example, in the S, by integration by parts, how much is it? You see, I can imagine this to be xy no? between 0 and L minus y uh, x, y prime, x, y prime, OK? But this is 0 because it's closed, OK? It's a closed curve. So if I evaluate the functions x and y at L, I have to get the same thing as 0, OK? But then if these two things are the same, you see, these are the two things which come here, I can erase one of them and erase the two, okay? 
Okay, let me keep it the positive one. So this is 0 L x y prime in ds. Okay. So if I also give, if, if this radius is r, how much is the area inside the circle below there? Well, that's a circle of radius r. Okay. So this is pi r squared. Okay. But by the same reason, it is what? So this is by geometric consideration. Remember, in fact, we, we, we still don't have any estimate on r. So this is just an almost useless at the moment consideration. But I can use the same trick I was using up here for the curve beta. Okay? So this is equal to minus the integral between 0 and L of x prime y bar. You see, now I choose the other one. Uh, the same property, but I choose the one with the minus, okay, in ds. So what do I get out of this? The area of r plus pi r squared plus this. Eh? But this is equal to the integral between 0 and l of the sum of these two integrals. So this is x y prime minus y bar x prime in ds. But now this is less than or equal to the integral between 0 and l of the square root of the square. It's a simple fact. x y prime minus y bar x prime squared. And then other manipulation. This is less than or equal to the integral between 0 and L of the square root of what? This is going to be longer. x squared plus y bar squared times x prime squared plus y prime squared. In ds. OK, I leave you to check these, but these are arithmetic nonsense. OK? I'm not using anything. Now, what I'm using, uh, now I use something. I use the fact that alpha was parameterized by arc length. If it's parameterized by arc length, that means that it's tangent vector as norm 1. But what is the norm of the tangent vector to alpha? Is the square root, if you want, of x prime squared plus y prime squared. If it's, that's equal to 1, also the square of it is equal to 1, which is exactly this object here. OK? So this is like e constantly equal to 1. OK? So this is exactly equal to the integral between 0 and L of the square root of x squared plus y bar squared in ds. But what are the functions x and y bar parametrizing? Note, eh? Note that I'm using the fact that s is the arc length for alpha. I have no idea if s is the arc length for beta. In general, it won't, OK? So the, but here I'm using its arc length for alpha. But now I'm left with this. But x, y bar is a parameterization of a circle of radius r, OK? So x squared plus y bar squared is r squared, OK? Of course, it, under square root, it has to be positive. So it's the integral of the constant r between 0 and l. So this is equal to LR. OK, so we are done. We are done because, well, at least we are done in proving 
improving the inequality. Okay, because now remember, I write it down here. So the simple, of course, arithmetic that I'm using is this, okay? I, I, I actually, a little hint to prove this, I've already used it, okay? You have to use that property here, okay? Now I use it again. It's Cauchy inequality, yeah. Okay, as you want. You are free to choose your favorite proof, okay? Now let me use again this property, this simple property here. And now I tell you the square root of the area of R times the square root of pi R squared. Okay, so that tells you what is A and what is B. This is less than or equal to 1 half times area of R plus pi R squared by that nonsense. But what we have just proved, we have just proved that this is less than or equal to LR, okay, divided by 2. So this is less than or equal LR over 2. Okay. But that's exactly the statement of the inequality because now divide by this and square it and you get exactly the isoperimetric inequality. Now I leave you with an exercise because the theorem was made of two parts. You had the inequality, which is here, but you had also the characterization of the equality. So if in this equality I get equal, I have to prove alpha itself was a circle. Okay? How is it possible that here I get equality? Well, it means that here I had an equality. It means here and here I had equalities. Okay? So exercise for you. If these are equalities, x and y parameterize a circle. Okay? <coughs> it's not completely trivial, eh? I must say. I remember when I was a student, it took me a bit of time to prove this. That's why I keep on giving it as a nice exercise because a little bit of sadism. Okay? Now, now we are really done. But let me tell you that, so it, this is all very classical and you can see we have not used very sophisticated mathematics. We have used 19th century mathematics. And yet, this kind of question is still an active area of research once you manipulate the question in a clever way. There are two possible clever manipulation of this type of problem. First of all, well, of course, Greeks, and I think I can be sure also Indians and Chinese and Africans or whatever, nobody has thought about doing geometry on something different than a plane before 200 years ago, okay? It has been since the, the birth of the topic that we are going to study starting next lecture, I mean, differential geometry, that people have realized that the same question we have been studying in Euclidean geometry should have been studied on a different ambient space, okay? Now, what does it mean, a different ambient space? It means, for example, instead of taking a simple closed curve in the plane, what does it happen to this problem if your universe is, for example, a sphere? So draw a simple closed curve on a sphere. Well, again, this encloses a, well, now you have, first you have a problem because you have two regions of bounded area. Okay, so which one you choose? 
Well, it's not difficult to decide which one should be the interior and the other one should be the exterior, but still. Is there an isoperimetric inequality? So among all curves with a given length on a sphere, is there one which maximizes the area inside? And if so, which one is it? And then, why the sphere? Why not asking the same question on any surface that you can think of? I mean, why, why you should rule out your universe to be something like this? Then start drawing simple closed curves. You can certainly measure length, you can measure areas, and you can ask the same question. This is much more difficult. And actually, we don't know in general the solution. Okay? In, some, for in the two cases I drew, we know, because these are surfaces of revolution. Okay? They have this kind of rotational symmetry, which makes the problem easier. Okay? But in general, we don't know. And again, but then there is a more sophisticated upgrade of the problem. So what are we really asking is the following. Think of the question in another form. We are fixing a one-dimensional, I mean, we are fixing a length, okay? And we are trying to maximize the area inside a curve of that length. Well, length is a one-dimensional measure. Curves are one-dimensional objects. Surfaces, so the inside, it's a two-dimensional thing. Well, we, we should be ready to ask the same question in any dimension. Meaning what? Fix a number. But then prescribe it to be the volume of an n minus one dimensional object. Can you fill this n minus one dimensional object in a maximal way with an n dimensional object? You see in how many ways you can ask the same question. The question is always the same. It's just an upgrade up to modern mathematics. Okay? But in all these forms, there are open problems. And these are kind of fundamental problems. Okay? Because again, you can also mix the two problems I was telling you together. You can ask the higher dimensional question in a space which is not Euclidean. Okay? This is a fascinating part of active research okay, in basic uh, differential geometry and analysis in some sense. Okay? So that's why, I mean, this is ground zero. Okay? This is the first issue of a series of problems which are open up to now. And I wanted you to have a little feeling okay, about this. OK, so I think for today, that's it. And this, this ends our study of curves. Okay? So on Thursday, we will start with surfaces.